afternoon. Uh, this is CIVE 632, Computational Hydraulics and Hydrology. And today is uh, November 17, 2021. And we continue to present the, uh, the numerical model of a groundwater model, how we put it together from the beginning. So that's the subject today. With that, I am going to uh, share the screen yeah, right, I got the screen in here. So you should be seeing now the green page, do you? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Uh, let me say, let me see what else in there. Uh, I'm still missing one person in there or not? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, I guess the arrow, the arrow is there. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, we are, I was, uh, uh, presenting this paper that we wrote many years ago, about 20 years ago, on, and, and what I need to do now is to finish it off. It's a very complex paper, and I certainly do not expect uh, you to, uh, to, to learn all the details. Uh, it's just too complicated. It will take a long time. It took us a long time to put this thing together. Uh, but I, I'm presenting here only for the purpose of showing you how things are done. Uh, we were developing this model from scratch. And that's the thing about um, numerical modeling. There's two types of users in numerical modeling. Those that use the models that have been developed by others, typically the government, and those that develop their own models. And the ratio is 1 to 1,000. In other words, for 999 users of models, there's one developer out there. However, uh, to be a good user, you should must or you must have developed some models or, or know how models are developed. And that's why uh, we're here in this class. Uh, uh, hopefully you will uh, get the knack as to how these things are done. If you're not going to get involved in it directly in the future, you, you may or may not. That depends on your choice. Okay, so we talked about how this model originates in the three-dimensional um, groundwater equation, sub, uh, re, um, simplified to two dimensions, and then we use the, the um, easy way out uh, on the scheme that was presented by O'Brien et al. If you recall, we discussed this already, and the scheme is just number nine, equation nine in here, which is the head, the advanced head, or rather, this, this equation number eight. And the advanced head at the advanced level is equal to the average of the heads at the known level. Because when we use D equal one, then this one cancels. So just take an average. So that makes it easy uh, for the computation to go ahead. There's no ifs and buts. It just goes on. And I'm going to show you today an example with a... Uh, with a grid size 100 by 100, so that's uh, 10,000 points, and it's running every six hours, so that, that's the delta T is six hours, and it is running for 20 years. That's a lot of computations, okay? And in order to show you how, how uh, what I say, what I mean, a lot of computations, um, we have been running this model for 20 years, and originally we put it together in Fortran. That was the year 1999, I believe. Yeah, that's right, because it was in 1999 that Cesar Erkan, who originated in Turkey, uh, got his master's degree with me, and we, and we did, with him, we did it together, okay? And, um, and uh, at that time, we used Fortran, because that's what we knew how to do it, and I mean, there's other alternatives out there, but Fortran is the fastest, for sure, the better behaved and the fastest. Um, then later on, uh, we had the opportunity to work online. The online situation came up around the year 2003, so three or four years later. Because uh, this tool, which we use a lot, which is PHP, was developed in the 2000s, I believe 2000, 2001. So a couple of years later, we, we got word of it and we started using it, I believe 2003. One of our first programs is dated 2004. And then um, we decided later on, uh, 10 years later, when I was working with, no, even more, uh, to convert our Fortran code 
to uh, PHP. For the heck of it, in order to uh, give a student a, a thesis subject, because I already done this in other occasions. Okay, so I gave uh, Jana, uh, Jana da Silva, who worked with me for the last couple of years, I said, Jana, you can take this code in Fortran and translate it into PHP. Okay. Uh, little did I know at the time, by the way, that PHP was going to be that slow. I knew it was slow. I figured it was more like one to 10. In other words, Fortran was running 10 times faster than PHP, but I was wrong. The number is more like 100 or even 1,000. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example. This Fortran code, or rather our Fortran code, which is very efficient, we know how to do that, would run this 20-year simulation every six hours, delta T six hours, in about three seconds. Three seconds is amazing. While the PHP does it in about 10 minutes. So you figured out what the ratio is. It's, it's a huge ratio. It would take 10 minutes. Um, why is that? I should answer that question because you must know. When Fortran was developed in the year 1950 or 1960, I believe Fortran was already uh, out by 1954 because it was quoted in a magazine that I happen to have an issue, uh, an issue of that magazine, okay? 1954, 1955. At that time, computers were being used by the engineers to do number crunching. So they really dedicated the power of Fortran to do number crunching. On top of that, Fortran has an advantage in terms of the speed that it does not run the language. In other words, it does not run the instructions of the language. It, it permits that the language be translated in, into machine code. And then Fortran runs only the machine code or the, uh, it's called the object code. Uh, that very, very few people would understand anyway. That's why they did Fortran because nobody could handle the machine code at the time. Uh, so that was uh, the issue. So that's why it is fast. In other words, when you run a Fortran code, you're not running the code itself. You're running the object code. The, not the original code, but the object code. So it's a lot faster. It's like the translation is taken out of the problem. And that is the reason why those of you that are going to be running HEC ROS and HEC HMS, most of you, as a matter of fact, uh, are going to be having a good experience. Fortran and, H and, and HEC RAS, I know for HEC RAS for sure, is extremely fast. You have not finished putting your, your finger on the, on the to, 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 to go to have the computer do the calculation. You lift your finger and the answer is right there. It is really amazing how fast it is. So it, because Fortran is at the core of RAS. Why is that? Because Fortran was developed rather RAS or the, the, and this, the predecessor of RAS was developed in the year 1968, 1970, and it was with Fortran. And the Army Corps, correctly, I think, never bothered to translate the code. They just proceed to use, they continue to use the code. They made some changes in the year 1998, but not main, major changes, only minor changes. So you are using Fortran. You may not know or may not think about it, but you're using Fortran when you run HECRAS. Absolutely. Okay? The, for, the Army Corps is not about to dump Fortran when, in fact, Fortran is the fastest thing around. Okay? Now, when, when the web came along back in the year 1994, 1995, everybody was on the web, was getting on the web. I remember San Diego State got a web lab at that time. I was a little bit slow in getting on the web. It took me a few years, <laughs> amazing. But eventually I got it. I was working with people that knew the stuff and I was curious about it and we got on top of it. Actually, as a matter of fact, it was Cesar Urkan that got me on top of it. When he came on, he signed up with me as a student and then he and I kind of got together and I learned HTML from him, as a matter of fact. He, the student introduced the professor to HTML and now I, do very well with HTML 20, 22, 23 years later. Okay, so um, at that time, the developers of PHP needed to, to make sure that the tool that they were gonna develop did everything, and I mean that, did everything. It could do this, it could do that, it could, it could handle questions, it could, all kinds of stuff. 
Okay, so they allowed this program to be very powerful. But in, in, in becoming a jack of all trades, it also became slow. That's the rationale. Okay, because they realized at the time that with the advent of the web and the fact that everybody was going to now be using the co computer, they didn't realize at the time, or maybe they did, that the computers were going to reduce to, uh, to handheld. Because every, every uh, cellular phone that I, it's out there, and there's about four or five billion of them, uh, is a computer. Okay, so everybody's using this stuff. And, uh, and they're using for all kinds of things, for posting pictures, for communicating on the web, for, for Facebook and stuff. They don't need number crunching. What they need is something that does everything expediently. So they did that. That's what PHP and other similar programs, by the way, it's not the only one, are, are geared for. That's, the, what, that's what they do best, everything. And since they do everything, they don't do it very effectively, certainly not the number crunching. Okay, so that's the reason why PHP is slow. Uh, I'm going to show you later on an example of uh, the, the thesis that we put together. And I'll show you the output, but, uh, but uh, I am telling you off the bat that it took a hundred or a thousand times more than the Fortran program in order to generate it. Okay, so, so now we're back in here now. We have now, we, I should stress the fact, and I think I already said that before, that a numerical model, a scheme, is not solved by just doing the interior points. In other words, if we got all the way from the, this is the interior point. Interior point equations 10, 11, 12, all, all the way to 16. That's interior point differencing, not boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are totally different. In other words, there are two problems to solve. There's interior points and the outside points, the boundary conditions. Uh, the solution is not complete until you, until you satisfy both. You have to satisfy both. Uh, you can have a very great scheme and if the boundary does something else, then the boundary will affect the solution, okay? A case in point, when we did our, our S-curve uh, calculation, our S-curve analysis in the year 1976, we decided we obviously were not going to solve all the worst problems. We were just going to try to find out if that there was some relation between the large waves and the little waves. In other words, the, the seven waves and the Lagrange waves. I, I didn't know that at the time. I just said, let me do this because it hasn't been done. Nobody has used the von Neumann technique on the sine van equations at the time. And I knew that because I was studying that. I was, I was getting a PhD on that subject. Okay, So I decided to do that, and to my amazement, I found the connection, the, the missing link between seven speed and Lagrange speed. And the rest, you know the story. Okay, but I decided at the time that I was going to do what it's called in mathematics a general solution, not a specific solution. So I didn't deal with the boundary conditions. You don't, you don't have a mention of boundary condition in my S curve paper because we didn't do it. We just did a general solution. Okay, but now we're talking about boundary conditions here because we're actually building a model in a, in a one dimensional model, which we have done many times. And I think I've shown you, I've shown you the, uh, the model by, uh, the, the loop rating, Muskingum Kanch, that's a boundary condition. In the Muskingum Kanch, there's only one boundary condition, upstream, and that's it. In the dynamic wave model, there's two. There's upstream and downstream. And this is something that um, some of you, I think, uh, I think Ryan will actually be looking into when you do your project in the next two, three weeks. Um, but when you get into 2D modeling, you have to satisfy the boundary or do something about the boundary throughout the boundary, throughout the domain. And in this case, I have an example in here of 100 by 100. It's a square of 100 by 100. So that's 400 and 404, I believe. It's 404 points along the perimeter of the square because it's 100 on each side, 400. Let's say 400. And all of them need to be specified one way or the other, okay? Right or wrong, you got to specify them. Otherwise, the model is not going to run. So you need to have some rules or some tools in order to, to specify the boundary conditions. And here we are. The boundary conditions can, in, in groundwater modeling, can be of Dirichlet or Neumann type. Dirichlet conditions specify the head. 
Newman condition specify the flux, that means the discharge, through the section, through the boundary. And um, also, there is question of permeable and impermeable. There are situations where you have permeability, in other words, water coming into the control volume, or impermeable, that something impermeable in there, because groundwater is interesting in the sense that uh, it can only flow if the, if the hydraulic conductivity is high enough. If it's low, it doesn't flow. It doesn't. You you, you can't get water mo a lot of water out of um, out of clay. It will it will take a long time, and you, you can't use it, right? Uh, so that's why you have aquifers that can release the water the water readily. The course of the aquifers are, or rather, an aquifer actually is coarse already. That's why it is an aquifer. Otherwise, aqua aqua comes from water aqua, right? So you have to have some trans transmissivity in there in order to be able to use it. Okay, so there's permeable versus impermeable. And then there's also mixed conditions. Mixed conditions are given by equation 17. And equation 17 is interesting. And you can notice it that if, you, if the alpha is zero, then it becomes an impermeable boundary. And alpha equal one becomes a permeable boundary. Permeable because it's the average. Impermeable because it's the same. <laughs> it's the same value. When it's the same value, uh, when, the, when the value is the same on the boundary and right next to the boundary, it, it is impermeable because there's no gradient to move the water, right? Water only moves with the gradient. And if the alpha is equal to, to 1, then this formula shows, and you can show it to yourself if you look at it carefully. It's, it's, a, it's a very smart formula. This one formula with an alpha gives you permeable or impermeable, right? And so if it's alpha is equal to one, it's a permeable boundary because it, it becomes an average. Alpha one, two, and the other one is one, and then the middle is the average of the two, but you don't want the middle, you want the one on the side, on the left, on the left, or on the right side, or the left, depending on how you look at it. And it becomes um, the average, it's an average. So. Anytime you develop a model, you gotta test it. You gotta test it because there's all kinds of things wrong that could happen. So we, uh, there's a bug in there. <laughs> I looked at it this morning, but I didn't see the bug. There's a, it says permeable, it's permeable. Permeable hot start. We needed to examine for our own illustration how this model was gonna work. And um, so we uh, these devised four tests. A permeable hot start, which is, is a condition that tests the model's ability to return to the steady equilibrium baseline following a depleted water table. In other words, if you have a depleted aquifer and you stop pumping and you want to find out, based on the hydrogeology, how fast, how, how long is it going to take to come back to equilibrium, original condition. Uh, we were interested in doing that in regards to the Ojos Negros aquifer in Baja California. And it turned out that it was about 16 years. If they stopped pumping all of a sudden, it was going to take 16 years to recover. Because that's just based on the properties of the aquifer. Now, that's the first one. The second one is permeable cold start. Okay, this condition tests the model's ability to achieve a steady state following the specification of uh, pumping. In other words, uh, there has been no pumping. So you start pumping a certain amount and you're going to find out when is it going to reach equilibrium. That's a fundamental one of basic problem of, uh, of uh, hydrogeology. Impermeable hot start. Since we have already had the permeable in the, in the permeable hot start and permeable cold start, we decided to go further. A little bit, I guess you could say esoteric. Impermeable hot start. This condition tests the model's ability to return to a steady state following an impermeable boundary. In other words, you pump it, it is, the boundary is impermeable, there's no water flowing in, and then you stop pumping, and then where does it return? It returns to a level much less than what it was before because you drew a lot of water and you have no way of replenishing it, right? That's the third one. And the fourth one is impermeable cold start. This condition tests the model's ability to simulate the linear depletion because you have an aquifer and it's impermeable and you stop pumping it and you pump it forever, 
you'll dry the aquifer until you can no longer extract any more water, right? Now, that's theory. In practice, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> we are good at theory because uh, people that have, have proven, there was a study made in, in, in uh, Nevada. Uh, it was a theoretical, not a theoretical, it was a, in fact, yeah, what did they say? It, it was an analysis of a situation, a local situation with local data where they started pumping and they pumped for 300 years. Well, they pumped in the computer, not actually. They pumped for 300 years and it never stopped. And what was going on is that you were drying the neighborhood. You first were drying the plants, you were drying this, you were drying the lakes, you were drying everything. And eventually you were borrowing or actually stealing, that's the better word, uh, water from the neighborhood. Wider and wider as time went by. So that means that if you were at a location and started pumping and pumping for five, pumped for 500 years, the likelihood is, <laughs> who's gonna pump for 500 years? This is theory. Uh, that you're gonna dry the neighborhood. The entire neighborhood would have to come to your help because you imposed a gradient and the, gradient, the, the water follows the gradient, okay? So let's keep going in here and we're gonna go a little further or a little faster in here because we gotta cover ground. Convergence testing. So we have some data in here. Oh, convergence testing. We want to see if the model was convergent. We knew it was stable because the cell Reynolds number was equal to one and theory and experience shows that that is the case. You could not specify a D greater than one because it would drop, it would bomb. 1.05 would be enough for the problem to go nuts. Okay, so you had to specify D equal one. So then the question arose as to, what about 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.5? Remember, we have experience with the mass kingdom. Uh, it, I know it's kind of silly, but we wanted to do it. We said, if you wanted, if you wanted to use it, D it should be one, not 0 0.5, because 0 0.5 is twice as hard or twice as intensive. But we did it anyway. We tried uh, Ds, different types of, types of Ds, and we got to this answer. What happened was that the head was, did not recover completely. It is a small value. It is a small value. You can look at this carefully and it's really a small value. It only recovered fully when the D, that is the cell, cell Reynolds number was equal to one. The, de, the defect or deficit was zero. That means that you started at a level, you, it pumped and it went back. When you stopped pumping, it went back. It recovered completely. To the original condition. But for cell Reynolds number equal 0.5, it did not recover. It's a small value, but nevertheless imperfect. For D25, and for the largest non-recovery was when the D is less than one eighth of D of one. We call that non-convergence. We know what that convergence means. Convergence means inaccuracy. There's nothing about stability. This is a stable model but it should give you the wrong answers. It only gives you the right answer when the cell Reynolds numbers equal one. So we prove that this is a beautiful example of how you can have a problem which behaves only for one condition and for other conditions it does not behave. Never mind, it's a small value in that in practice, you probably wouldn't even notice it. But theory is one thing and practice is another and they go together. Okay, so still look at the situation. For the depth equal to 800 for a, an aquifer which is 800 meters, you had a you had a let me see 798 I think this is the number, so a two meter difference in the response when the cell Reynolds number was very low, and that two meter difference is it's already high I think it's two meters, 798.4 right it's a 1.4 meters, okay so that is a show or how how to show the issue of convergence not just we talked about convergence in surface water. Now we're talking about convergence in groundwater. Then we try the, the so-called permeable, impermeable, hot, cold tests. We tried four tests. Permeable, hot, permeable, cold, impermeable, hot, impermeable, cold. And this is what happened. That now, we're gonna, now we're gonna show the beauty of our model, the precision of the model. One of the things the model has to do Besides calculating the water levels, which is obviously it has to calculate the water levels, it also has to show that it didn't lose any volume, it didn't lose any mass. 
because you know Abbott is the great guy that said in 1975, when I listened to him and I was in Colorado as a student and he was a professor, he said that when you develop numerical models, you, you have to make sure that they don't lose mass because if they do, then you have, you're no good. You have nothing because losing mass artificially is not a good thing to do. And you have heard me talk about that already. The mass income country variable parameter loses a very small amount of mass because it is off-centered. And anytime you are off-centered, something happens in there. Okay, so head at, uh, head at the center field node, not node for permeable hot start, permeable cold start in here. So these are situ these different situations that are very responsive. In, in the first case, we got total 100% of the volume. Look at this, 50,000 millions of cubic meters. That, that's in the SI is hectometer cube, millions of cubic meters, 50,000. It was perfect agreement. For the primitive cold start, it got to, it got to 99.98, which we obviously, for practical purposes, we would consider that it is almost perfect, almost perfect. Likewise, in here, head at center field node for permeable cold start test, an impermeable cold start test. And finally, the linear depletion of the aquifer. The aquifer is coming down. It's coming down, however long you run it, it's, it's coming down. So, in summary, stable and convergent two-dimensional groundwater model of a homogeneous isotropic aquifer has been developed and tested under a wide, wide range of flow conditions. The model is explicit, so anybody could do it. Really, anybody could do an, an explicit model. You just have to sit down a few hours, maybe a few days in order to do it. And can account for the following. You must know, of course, some programming tool. Uh, you could do it in, in Excel, but it would take you forever to run. Excel is slow. Uh, the objective of Excel is to make the things easy for you, not to run fast. Excel, as a matter of fact, is slow. I have I don't use too much Excel, actually. I use hardly any Excel because we already have more advanced tools to do. And, and uh, I kind of preceded, I, I, I'm not justifying this, but I preceded the generation of Excel. Excel came about in 1992, 1991, 1992. I was already 25 years an engineer at that time. We had other things. To be honest with you, and I'm going to say this outright, it needs to be said. I always looked down on Excel because I, saw, I thought Excel was cell-based. Hmm, that's funny. Excel comes from excellence, I believe, but it, it is tied to the cell. C-E-L-L. -L. So if you make a mistake in a cell, Excel doesn't work. How many cells you got? You can have a hundred, you can have a thousand, you can have ten, a million cells. Excel is huge. It could be huge, right? So you got to be extremely careful. You got to be awake all the time in order not to make a mistake. While in other methods that are global, like Fortran, if you make a mistake in one cell, it shows up immediately in all the cells because it's global. So you will always know when you made a mistake in Fortran. While in Excel, you will not. And I'm not telling you anything you do not know. You already know that. I'm very careful. Uh, Professor Valdez told me one day that he spent a whole summer reviewing a thesis or a couple of theses of one of his students that did a lot of Excel. And he said he had to review every cell of Excel in order to make sure that it was correct. And he was correct. Okay, so let me finish in there. Let me finish in there, and now I'm going to go in here, hopefully. This is just kind of a show in here. This is the model that uh, um, Jana, Jana Da Silva put together a year ago. It was in July, I believe. July of 2001, right, a year ago. Was it? It was maybe a year, no, it was, yeah. 2000, no, 2000, the year 2000. 2001 is now. She's been gone for about a, a year now. And so this put together, this is a friendly and the way I, I uh, in, in, instructed Jana how to do this. And she did it. And this model runs by itself so that you can use it as a, as a beginner in order to see how it works and what it does. Okay. And in here, uh, we, we are simulating here 
the recovery, like, like a hot start. So we specify 100 nodes. Can you see this? 100 nodes. 10, 100 by 100. I only printed the 10. I could print like an Excel sheet every one, but it would be too huge. I couldn't handle it. So 10 is fine to show an indication of what is actually going on in here, both X, X space and Y space. I'm going to show you that this model is near to perfect. Okay. In order to do that, I'm going to hope I, I was doing this for about five, 10 minutes before I started. I should have started earlier, but I hadn't realized that. So we specify in the middle from 30 to 70, like in the middle, we specify 400, just for the heck of it, 400. So this is gonna, since it's a groundwater model and it has to follow the equations, it has to start leveling up. So eventually, if we leave it alone, there's no pumping, the 400 will become 500. So the question is how long would it take to do that given the hydrogeologic uh, properties, uh, S and, and the diffusivity actually, it's a diffusivity, which is, which is K over S. Uh, K is hydraulic conductivity and S is the storage. So you have in here. Now you can see how this thing really works very well. After 30 days of the first year, the 400 originated here is already 400 or 81. Can you, the 50-50. So let's take a look at the 50-50 at the value in here and what it is actually doing, okay? So remember, 400.081 after 30 days, okay? Then 60 days, it got 402. It went up, right? 60 days. 408, 415, 421. It's going up. The center is going up. The center is the lowest, and it is going up. Okay, it is going up right now. So we continue to do in here, let's take a look in here, 455. Over here is 468. And we keep going in here. Now we are in year three, and I am afraid that we're not gonna get there. It's still running. The program is still running. Year 13, now at year 13 is already for, to 499. Can you see that? It's almost at 500, but it's not there because it's asymptotic. Okay, so we got in here to year 17, year 18, year 19, year 19, year 19, year 19, year 19. Cross your finger in here, year 19. It's got to go to year 20. We told it to go to year 20. Year 20, you're right, we're lucky. It finished. On year 20, all at the entire water surface, or rather the entire uh, Water level throughout the domain has recovered to the original value. Year 20. Year 20. Uh, of course, year 20 has a lot of every this is this printed every month. It runs every six hours, but it is printed every month. So you can imagine every six hours, 10,000 nodes, 20 years. You can imagine the amount of computation that this thing went through, right? And again, I'm going to finish off by saying that this is slow and it's like a turtle pace. Fortran is fast, it is like a like hair. I mean, very far, very fast. Okay, so if you're looking for speed, Fortran. And most people that know that already know it. HEC, HEC does it. If you're looking for any, everything else, which Fortran cannot do, then you should you go to the surrogates, which are a PHP, there's, um, there's several programs out there that people like to use. I know there's a popular program. I don't use it. I don't remember the name right now, but everybody's talking about it. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier than PHP. PHP is, is intricate. Let's say at least, at least, it's very intricate. It's very non-forgiving PHP. You really got to know your stuff. I know that. I've been doing PHP for 15 years. And I got into PHP through Fortran. And PHP is not Fortran because PHP has C in there. And C is beyond Fortran. With the caveat, and I should tell you this, the Fortran works all the time and is nearly perfect, while C does not. C has its quirks, has its problems. And people that work with these know that. Uh, so that's why for strict calculation, we prefer C. 
I'm sorry, we prefer four kinds. But C was developed and it was used and a lot of people use C. As a matter of fact, uh, HEC RAS, I believe, uses C because when they did it back in the late 2000s, uh, 1997 is when they did the, the, the uh, mode, um, the GUI mode of a, a RAS was done in 1997. They were using C. They told me, I, I went over there and visited with them and they told me that. They were, I was curious as to find out what exactly they were doing because at the time there was no PHP. And by the way, I do not believe, I could be wrong on this, but I do not believe that the Army Corps has ventured into the online calculation. They give you a model that you could run. You download and you install in your, mo in your computer and you could run it. They don't give you service for it. They don't ask questions. They just give it to you for free. The idea is that they're going to develop for them, for their use, for the Army Corps use. But they don't mind, mind sharing it with you as long as you don't ask any questions. I have tried calling them and no answer on the phone. And, and, and I'm a professor. Can you imagine somebody else, a user? Uh, I, would, I would say they wouldn't have any luck. So you got to know what you're doing. And that is the reason why you need to take theoretical classes like the, not theoretical, but classes in the subject matter, like the ones I have taught here at San Diego State, so that you can understand some of the things that they're saying. And then eventually hoping, or hopefully, you'll spend time with it and learn its quirks. Like you have to spend a couple months, three months doing it like our consultants, so that then you finally run it a hundred times and you know exactly what's going to do it, what is going, what the model's going to do because you've already done it. It's like videos. I, I've been developing videos for several years now, but the last couple of years since the pandemic, I got really, really smart because I do it so often and so much that, that I know if there's going to be a problem and how to solve it. Practice makes perfect, they say. So I'm going to stop in there. Luckily, we have succeeded in, in getting there at the end. It must have taken maybe 10, 15 minutes because I put it, I put it to start before I, before I started the class. Actually, it's only 40. We we're already 40 minutes into the class, so it could have well taken more than 15 minutes. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter at this point. So let's take a look at the next paper, Parking Lot Storage Modeling Using Professor. Yes. Um, I don't. We. Don't, I don't think we can see the right screen. We're still on the last paper. Oh, I see. Because it was a different. Okay, it was a different. Uh, yeah, it was a different share. Now, how about that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Right? Yeah. Okay. Parking lot storage modeling using efficient ways. We have already, I believe, touched base on this paper, but I'm going to just kind of go over it quickly because it does kind of relate to what we're saying right now. Um, actually, it is the first paper in the chapter of application. So we're a little bit ahead, but I want to be ahead because I want to spend some time in the next couple of weeks. We only have three lectures because we have a holiday next week. So let's get ahead a little bit. Okay, I hope to finish this paper today. Uh, parking lot storage modeling using diffusion waves. Okay, so now I have to introduce Amy Club Bundy, who worked with me in the year 1998, 1999. And she came up and wanted to do a thesis. I take that back. It was not a thesis. This was a, a mini thesis. It was interesting because at the time, you, students were not obliged to do a mini thesis. They could just take the exam. But she wanted to do some research with us. So I said, I've got this model. Let's run it. Let's run it for practice. I said, what you need to do is identify four parking lot sizes, small, medium, large, and very large, in four uh, storms, storms, intense storms low intensity, middle intensity, high intensity, and very large, and run four by four, 16 cases in this model that I have with the sizes given and the storms given and study the diffusion because this is what I want to do, study the diffusion, study how, how it happened. Because at the time, and I should tell you at this time, that the kinematic models that were available, the, the Army Corps models, did not do the job completely. They did only 90% of it. As much as they tried to get the Quran number close to one, they could never, they could never do it perfectly because
this is tricky to do in a model. Uh, so if they didn't get it to one, then it was going to be there's going to be an error in that, that they couldn't control. Uh, it's a small error, I should say that. And the error decreases when you have with high resolution. So if you're going to get rid of, really get rid of the error, you put a high resolution in there, L over dx equal 100, and you probably get rid of the error in the kinematic way. But if it's coarse resolution, then you don't get it. While this one's good independent, I've already shown that. I showed that in the year 1986 with a paper that I published. And that got me uh, my the invitation in the next year, in the following year, to go to lecture over at HEC. Because they, <laughs> they got that paper, they read it, the people that are important over there read it, and they realized that they hadn't, any, any, they hadn't seen anything like that. People talking about grid independence and showing grid independence. So they called me and I gave them a, a talk, which is on the web, by the way. I was when I was young, I was only 41 years old at the time. I was full of energy at the time. Okay, so what we're gonna do in here is then uh, run this model extensively, 16 times, different four different storms and four from the four different sizes. Okay, I should mention to you at this time that there is a difference between reality and modeling. Modeling can never do completely reality. We have to give up or cut corners a little bit. And I am not saying that what we're doing here is accurate from a standpoint of practice. What I'm saying is that if the situation were to be the way we pose it, this is what's going to happen. And that's a totally different story than actual, even though we were using actual storms and actual sizes, we still have the wooden plane. We cannot get away from the wooden plane. So the wooden plane is going to do a few things that nature does not really like to do. But we don't have any other choice. That's the way we do it. That's that's the way HEC does it and so forth. There's always a wooden plane. Um, so people have tried to do, to get a, a way from the wooden plane. Wilheiser tried for, tried for a while and he couldn't do it. Came back and still the wooden plane, 40 years after wooden put it together, 1965, uh, 40, 50. 55 years, yes, 65, 70, yeah. 55, no, 1965 would put us 45 plus 20, 65, yeah. 65 years after wooding developed the wooding plane, we're still using it because it's simple and it's workable. Anything else would be very complex, which is, this is not to say that a GIS has, has not come in and thrown a monkey wrench on the process. What is a monkey wrench? A monkey wrench is something that you throw in there kind of, you know, to ask questions or answer questions. And this has been a problem. And I'm not a GIS expert, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. But I, I do believe now that there are two hydrologies out there. The hydrology, the conventional hydrology, which is the wooding plane, which works reasonably well. And this is what I'm gonna be talking today. And the unconventional hydrology or the new hydrology of the last 20, 30 years, that arose with GIS, where God knows what they do in terms of running the flow here and there. Okay, I happen to know that because I've, I've had experience with that, and and I know many of you that have worked with GIS know that too. I have several questions or pro, uh, stories that I can tell you about that, but I'm not going to. Okay, so uh, urban development decreases surface runoff and infiltration rates, thus, thus decreasing the time of concentration and increasing surface runoff. I'm sorry, I take that back. Urban development decreases surface roughness and infiltration rates, thus decreasing the time of concentration and increasing surface runoff. We know that. To counter this trend, runoff detention and retention is now being used as an alternate, alternative strategy. What happens is that Without runoff detention and retention, you drain the water from the premises and it creates a flood downstream. So you solve the problem of the local flood, but it was at the expense of creating a problem of the regional flood. And we know that for a fact. That's been talked in every quarter, okay? The solving of the flood problem in one place creates uh, a problem, a bigger problem in the neighborhood or in the region, the regional effect. Uh, 
In the last 20, 30 years, uh, since the work of Stare and Urbonas, that was in 1990, they have a book on this. They worked uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, they pioneered the issue of retention. You should hold on to the water. Don't drop it because what you're doing by paving is accelerating. So now you should retain in order to decelerate so that you would not have an effect on the flood. The theory is that you should really should not have an effect on the flood. You should do everything to make sure that where you accelerate it is later decelerated before it leaves the premises. And this is called retention and detention. And by the way, this is very popular nowadays in, envir in the environmental field. Uh, many detention and retention structures have been built and continue to be built throughout the United States and perhaps even throughout the world. Okay. One thing that we developed in this paper, well, not really in this paper, we did it early, and we have a paper on that, which I believe I have not had you read that paper. I'm going to check that. I'm, my memory at this point is fuzzy. But you recall the diffusion wave modeling of catchment dynamics. That's one of my famous papers, right? That I reemphasized a lot. Then we wrote a number two, a number two paper, but that paper unfortunately was not published. We, we got shot down on that paper. I don't know exactly why, but we did get shut down. So, so then we published it on the web. We published it first in a, in a proceedings, which nobody reads because they cannot get, gain access to it. Although I take that back because now they're putting the proceedings on the web. Everybody's putting everything on the web. I'm sure ESC is in doing that too. But so it used to be where it was almost impossible to get a proceedings paper, but now that is being ameliorated because of the web because you can post the stuff on the web, right? So, so the paper was not published, but it was published at proceedings, and then eventually I published it on the web. So to my, in my mind, it is already published. It was published on my website. But never, never mind, um, we developed this, that, that uh, idea, and then this idea we pursued in this paper. We call kinematic drainage, the strategy that produces a storm hydrograph rising at the fastest possible rate. Diffusive drainage, on the other hand, is that which produces a storm hydrograph rising at rates lower than kinematic. Kinematic is a ceiling. Anything less is diffusion. If you have a whole lot, then it becomes diffusion dynamic, which technically, according to many people that have written on this subject, the dynamic way doesn't exist. So theoretically, it doesn't exist. In practically, it doesn't exist. Okay, so the calculation of diffusive drainage is possible to diff with the diffusion wave model, not with the kinematic wave model. You have to do the diffusion wave model, which is this model, by the way. People have pursued the diffusion wave model afterwards. Orlandini and Rosso, to my knowledge, were the first ones in 1996, picked up our ideas and tried to put them together in their own shop. And they must have, actually. And then everybody else kind of followed, followed suit and they're doing it right now, 30 years. I, th I think I already told you the story about uh, I met a gentleman from uh, DIH, no, I'm sorry, DHI, Danish Hydraulics, over in uh, Mexico. And I asked him what he was doing. And he says he was implementing the diffusion wave model into the SHE model. The SHE model is the big European model, system hydrologic European. And in the year 2012, we're implementing the diffusion wave model into their into their model, into the sheet model. So you can see these models are in constant development and any new subject gets eventually taken up, but it takes time. We put the diffusion wave model for the first time in 1986. And you can see that the Europeans were in the year 2012 picking it up. So that is how many years? 26 years later, it takes time. It takes time for these things to, to, to run through the system. So the diffusion wave model, I have already talked about it. I'm not going to dwell on it. So we have the testing program now. So I asked, uh, um, I forgot her name. I asked uh, Amy, how did I forget the name? I asked, I asked Amy to identify form four extreme storm depths for the San Diego urban area. We want to showcase the San Diego area. Uh, storm type, depth, duration, intensity. So as you can see in here, uh, the depth is what is greater. The intensity, the intensity is higher when the depth is lesser. That is a fact of nature. 
because nature, nature does not, nature reigns in kind of in bursts. So, so therefore, uh, if you have a burst, if you're in the middle of the burst, then you have a lot of rain, a lot of intensity. But if you're a little bit far ahead, there's no intensity. The intensity is much reduced. And that's the, the spatial variability, spatial and temporal variability of the storm is one of the major problems that we have in hydrology. We've tried to fix that with radar data. And I, I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not going to comment. But still, I do believe that there's a, that is a problem, a problem of lack of full accuracy. As, as a matter of fact, um, uh, that's not, those not the only one, because when you talk about the entire modeling thing, the infiltration is a, is a big guess. And the variability of, of spatial, if not temporal, variability of infiltration is a big guess. So every subject of modeling that we do is just because we wanted to get a sense on the problem. I said that, and I'm going to repeat it again. Modeling is not to get an answer. People should not model to get an answer. You should model to get a range of answers that cover the variability of your design. And at that point, you'll have much better judgment to do the right thing. Because without the modeling, you haven't thought about it. And gosh, you could do anything, right? You didn't study it. And model, the, what model does it is, is allows you to think graphically and with perspective of what's going on. Without the model, you can't really think too much in the sense that you cannot find the pros and cons or the ifs and buts of the actual nature, the functioning of nature. So <laughs> I am a modeler. I've been a modeler for 50 years. Uh, I, I will defend modeling to the end, and it's true. Uh, those that don't do it or don't believe in it, well, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna comment on it, but modeling is, is here to stay, okay? In every field, by the way, not just in hydraulics. So extreme storm depths for the San Diego urban area. Uh, let me just skip another comment that I was going to make, but it's kind of too much at this point. So we have four typical parking lots. Four typical parking lots. A, very small. B, small. C, large. And D, very large. And then the equilibrium flows. The equilibrium flows can be calculated by Q equal IA. We're not going to use infiltration here. So Q equal IA, that's the equilibrium flow. We know that from convec convection theory. That's in chapter four of my book. So we're going to run these models, uh, the model, the, the model that I have, and it's a, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do, by the way. Once you, the difficult thing to do is to, is to get the data. So I charge uh, Amy with doing, getting the data, get the typical watersheds, get the typical rainfalls, and we're going to run it through the model. Uh, in 16 times, we ran it 16 times. So what do we have in here? We have storm type one, storm type one, Q over Q sub V, e, that means relative, dimensionless discharge, which is the way it should be plotted, by the way. And uh, the storm type one, parking lot A, B, C, and D. So that's four of them. And we have the hydrographs coming out. And the hydrographs have, okay, so this, those are hydrographs coming out. And the second one, the same, kind of the same. The third one, somewhat different, and the fourth one, somewhat different, because these are larger, larger basins. You can see more volume in there. Now, the thing to, to find out, the conclusion to find out in this regard is that if the rain is long enough, all the watersheds will reach the peak. If the rain is long enough, all the watersheds will reach the peak. But this one didn't reach the peak because the rain was not long enough. So the hydrograph is a result of the interaction between the rain and the area. If the area is short, they will reach the peak. If the area is large, time of concentration wise, it will not reach the peak, it will, it will stay in there. So then the issue is, how come these graphs kind of start slow? And the answer is because the slope is 0.1. According to the Hayami formula, the diffusivity is influenced very much by the slope, okay? So for slope of 0.1%, now, what slopes were we going to use in this regard? We started with 1% and we stopped with 0.1%. Because I know for a fact that um, building construction doesn't want to go above 2% because they, 
they think it's too steep, where they grade the, the land. And they want to don't go above or below 0.1% because it's difficult to construct. 0.1% very difficult. So the lowest I have seen is 0.5. But we want to go to 0.1 just for the heck of it, just to show how the behavior. And we didn't go above one, we don't think it's necessary. So between the round numbers of 1% and 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1, we, we encase this problem. Because we were going to show trends. That's what we're going to do, show trends. So as you can see, the trend is correct. All the slopes, to an extent, diminish the, the, diminish the, uh, the rise in hydrographs. Some of them are a little, a little more, a little less, but they all, and some of them do not reach the peak. Like here, you're supposed to reach the peak at one. These one reach the peak, but this one doesn't because it doesn't reach the peak, it gets cut in the middle of it, and then it has to come down. We call this diffusion. You can see diffusion is the obliteration of the peak. So if the peak was shaved off, then it, it was in effect a diffusive system. So from this knowledge is that we uh, developed that concept, which we wrote up, and I believe we have read it. I believe we have read it on what's the difference between channels, reservoirs, and watersheds. And uh, the watershed behavior came out of these graphs that show precisely what's actually going on. And the conclusions, the conclusions are in here. As the slope decreases from point from one to point one percent, the rate of rise of the outflow hydrograph decreases. Right, this is the rate of rise over here, delaying the attainment of equilibrium, increasing the time of concentration from kinematic to diffusive, and spreading the outflow hydrograph. See, for instance, for a storm duration less than the diffusive time of concentration, the delay in the attainment of equilibrium reduces subconcentrated catchment flow. It results in effective diffusive behavior. So we got diffusive behavior here because the slope is producing the diffusive behavior in the watershed. For the shorter storms, the equilibrium of outflow is not attained in most cases because the storms are short. The spreading results in effective diffusive behavior. In other words, it, reach, it doesn't reach the peak and it spreads out. Any spreading is diffusion, by the way. For the longer storm, the equilibrium of outflow is attained However, the delay results in the spreading of the outflow hydrograph that is in effective diffusive behavior. So we conclude that for, very, for various reasons, depending on the area, the storm, and the slope, you can cause diffusion in a watershed. Sherman realized all this stuff, but he didn't have the benefit of hindsight with the computer, with the models that we had in 19... Uh, I told you that the progression is, is, uh, is Wooding 1965, Wooding together with Shockey, 1965. Those were the first gentlemen or, or persons that, that did this calculation on the plane, on the Wooding plane. So forward 1965 to 1986, that's when Professor Pons did it, 20, 21 years later, okay, because we had a model. We didn't want to do the kinematic way because we had already been done. I had to do something new, and we did the diffusion way. That had not been done at the time. But, uh, but Sherman was working in 1932. He was in charge of the hydrology of many of the large dams in the United States, and we used to build a lot of dams. Most of the dams in the United States were built between 1920 and 70. Those were the 50 years of dam construction. Right after 70, kind of we reached a, a problem with the environment. People started talking about the environment. So then we are no longer building as many. I would say not even a tenth of what used to be. Every, every time, now you build a dam, you got to justify it to the hill. In the past, you didn't. You didn't have to. You just build a dam. The civils came in and they did it without asking anybody, by the way. Should I say that? I'm a civil. <laughs> I, 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 I talk like a biologist, but I'm a civil. Uh, we came in and did it without asking anybody. The Army Corps built Bonneville. I visited Bonneville. And I, sh I think I shared with you the, no, not with you, with the other class, the, the fish ladders of Bonneville Dam. And not only Bonneville, every, every major dam out there in the Pacific Northwest has a, uh, has a, a ladder. Those retrofit, they had to build the ladders because the salmon could not go up the, up the 200 foot high uh, dam, roughly 150, I think. It varies, it varies. The height of the dams vary. Okay, 
So we stop there to show you then effectively, well, I think I, I go back to the Sherman story. The Sherman couldn't do it, but he knew that he could not use the rational method that had been invented in the year 1889. So the rational method was around 34 years, even earlier. Some people quote the rational method even earlier. So Sherman knew the rational method, but he knew that he couldn't do it because the larger the basins, the peak was totally exaggerated, exaggerated and uncertain in the case of the rational method. Don't forget that the rational method has a C and nobody had a way of determining a C for a large basin. The rational method was basically used for small drainages, but he didn't have a small drainage. He had two, 3,000 square, square miles. So he could not use the rational method. He was against the wall. I got to design this. I got to give these guys a design value, and I don't know. That's what Sherman found himself doing this in 1932. So he developed the concept of unit hydrograph, which was a step forward better than the rational method for the mid-sized basins. And that's the reason why in our book, in our hydrology book, we decided to separate the, the analysis in terms of scale. For the small basins, urban drainage, it was going to be rational method. For the mid-sized basins from, from one square mile to 400 square miles, it was going to be Sherman's field, uh, mid-sized basin. And anything above mid-size 400 to 1,000, and we had an example with the Santa, Santa Cruz Basin in Arizona, which I had already done at the time. Luckily, I had that study. I learned a lot from that study. That had to be done in somewhat different way. You had to divide it in order to apply the Sherman method to the specific sub-watersheds and then put it together. But then the putting it together was not easy. It had to be done with routing. It had to be done with some kind of topology that would allow you to route the water from here to there. Because routing is a good thing, it's a hydraulic thing. Routing is hydraulics, and we already talked about extensively, the Muskingum Gange and so forth. But getting into the actual connectivity in a watershed, the, the connectivity of the, I guess you could say the, the network, usually dendritic network, but a network, ne network nevertheless, would have to be done with a mathematical tool that we call topology, topology, which means regional anatomy, which allows the model to not to lose track of where the water is going or where it's coming from. Now, different models have different topologies. And I do believe that HEC has some kind of simple topology. We'll see, we'll take a look at that later. At any rate, topology is at the heart of all the watershed models. You don't need any topology in the unit hydrograph. You certainly you don't need it in, a, in the rational method. But when you get to routing watersheds, you must have some topology over there. That is, if you're building a model. If you're not building a model, you're using HEC, HMS, and it's fine. You're going to use whatever HMS says you should be used. OK? Uh, I think uh, Danny is working on this, right, Danny? Yeah, you're working on the HMS, the, the, only, yeah. the only HMS. Take a look at that, by the way. It illustrates us how exactly is it that HMS does its topology. Mm -hmm. I have to be knowledgeable on this subject. Okay, so that's the summary. Okay, that's the end of it. And we are actually exceeded our time here. Uh, and now we're going to go to the next uh, paper. Oh, oh, that's the one that comes with, the, comes with topology. Well, let me introduce the subject because we are not going to finish here. We only have 11 minutes. We have talked about all kinds of stuff, all kinds of applications. So now we get in the hydrology. Okay, the previous one was hydraulics, actually. Now we get to hydrology. Uh, I think I already said that the difference between hydrology and hydraulics is that is a focus. Hydrology is focused on converting precipitation into runoff. And hydraulics is focused on converting runoff to, to pressures and stages. That's a clear division. But sometimes in the middle, right in the middle, you cannot see the one or the other. Um, if you're doing routing, for instance, 
Routing actually is divided in the books as hydrologic and hydrolytic. Hydrologic routing is the one that is based on the, on the discharge measurements and calibrating the mass kingdom, the K and the X, by using discharge measurements. So the hy hydrologic routing doesn't really have any hydraulics, and doesn't have any mechanics on it or associated with it. That's why it's called hydrologic, because hydrologic really, uh, I'm not going to, let me say this, de-emphasizes or does not use too much mechanics. On the other hand, hydraulics is based on mechanics. It comes from fluid mechanics. So they're quite different, but they kind of meet together at the routing issue. The routing, if the routing is Q to Y, is hydrologic. You figure out what the Q is, and then you get a tool to figure out what the Y is. It's called the rating curve. But if the routing is Q and Y, then, then it's hydraulic routing. That's the hydraulic routing of of Danny Fred. Danny Fred that did hydraulic routing by calculating Q and Y independently of each other in a model and where he used the Prizman scheme. Then you see the difference between hydraulics and hydrology. Hydrology has a tendency to be a little simpler, but that is only because the problems of hydrology is a lot, they're a lot more complex than the problems of hydraulics. Hydraulics is focused. The dam, the channel is focused. Hydrology, hydrology could be the, the, the watershed of the Nile, for all we care, or the Amazon. We had, a, we had a faculty, I don't know if I should tell you this story, I already started. We had one of our faculty members uh, claim that uh, he had done the Amazon Basin or something like that. And I got word of it, I said, the Amazon Basin? Nobody's ever, and nobody will ever do the Amazon Basin. What actually happened was that he took one stream in the Amazon. I think it was a Purus over in the border between Peru and Brazil and studied the routing in the Purus. So one, one out of 8,000. Did you, did you do the Amazon? No. Did you just do a stream in the Amazon basin? The routing on the stream, the analysis and so forth, the, whatever it is that it takes to do what it should modeling. And you guys know very well, and we're going to be talking about that. That's the subject of this paper, by the way, watershed model. Okay, in 1983, there was a problem in Arizona. Here, there, this map over here shows the state of Arizona. And over here, the, the darkened area is the Santa Cruz Basin in southeastern Arizona. It's a basin that originates in, in the Santa Margarita Mountains in here. It goes in here, actually, actually, it's over here, right, right, right there. This is the basin. As you note, as you note, a uh, percentage of it is south of Nogales, that is in Mexico. We have lots of along the border basins that are together linked. I mean, there's a straight line in here. This is a straight line. California also has a straight line in there. But this is the Santa Cruz Basin in Arizona. It has the Santa Cruz River. Now, the Santa Cruz River, if you look at the Santa Cruz River, here, there it is. The Santa Cruz River originates over here. I believe these are called the Santa Margarita Mountains. I'm not quite sure. It's been, it's been 35 years since we did this study. But it goes into Mexico, as you can see, the Santa Cruz. It's called Rio de Santa Cruz over here. And Santa Cruz River over here when it goes into the United States. And then it flows north. It goes through the city of Tucson. Okay, and there's three gauges in here. Mm, I'm looking for the gauge, right. The continental gauge. There's a gauge over there, USGS gauge. Then there's the Cor Congress gauge, which is Congress Street in Tucson. And then there's the Cortero gauge, which is, which is at the end of the basin. Because at this point, my understanding, I could be not 100% on this, is that at this point, it meets one of the other tributaries of the Gila River. The Gila River, J-I-L-A, moves in this area through northern Arizona. No, not northern, southern Arizona. Let's see that. No, I take that back. Gosh, it's been a while. Okay, over here, as you can see from this map, at this point is the Cortero Gauge. And then we have the Santa Cruz River continues over here. And over here, south of Phoenix, it meets the Gila River 
which comes from here, all the way from New Mexico, even. The headwaters of the Gila River are in New Mexico. Gila, you guys have heard of the Gila Monster? Danny? Yeah, I have. Have you seen one? Um, I don't think in person, but pictures. Pictures, right, yeah, yeah. It's an ugly monster out there in the Southwest, the Southwest United States and Mexico. Um, okay, so at this point it meets the Gila and then it goes, runs through Phoenix over here and it meets the Salt River and it continues as Gila and it eventually gets to Yuma at which time it meets the Colorado, which is coming over here. So the Gila drops into the Colorado. Okay, so that's the hydrography of this particular region. Okay, what happened was that in the year 1983, there was a lot of misbehavior, hydrologic misbehavior throughout the Pacific, okay? It was centered in Peru as everything, <laughs> I should, I should say, uh, it's lucky, that, uh, I was gonna say it, everything centers in Peru, that's not true. But El Nino does, the El Nino phenomenon centers in Peru. The eye of El Nino is in Peru, northern Peru, to be precise. Why? Ask nature, you know? So it's in northern Peru, and then it kind of reverberates. It goes through the entire Pacific. The farther you go, the less the influence. But the United States, I guess, it is close enough to Peru that it does affect the hydrology. So when there's a strong El Nino, people here over in California are wondering if it's gonna get, get over here or not. And that, by the way, has happened many times. The hydrologists in charge know that if there's something happening in Peru, sooner or later something's going to happen here too and that has been repeated in many years throughout the record by the way 83 was the first one where we took notice because the 83 el nino in peru was the strongest of the century and it caused a problem in the in the colorado and a problem in the santa cruz among two that i happen to know about and have worked on them okay uh the Colorado, I did not work on. That was in 1983. I have the video because I happened to be uh, friends with uh, Phil Berge, who was working with the Bureau of Reclamation. I don't know how exactly I met Phil Berge, but he's a good guy, very good guy. And uh, I went over there to Denver on a visit in the year 1984 and went to visit Phil at the Bureau of Reclamation. And he gave me uh, that tape that I have, that I stored. I stored the tape on the failure of the Glen Canyon Spillway. The failure of the Glen Canyon Spillway, 1983. How did that happen? Well, that was related to the El Nino. It was related to the El Nino. They had a, a huge amount of rainfall throughout the Colorado Basin, and it really, oversized, rather not oversized, but overwhelmed. It overwhelmed the spillway, which by the way, had been built 20 years earlier and it had never been used because a spillway is like insurance. You design and build a spillway hoping that you'll never use it, right? It's like insurance. Imagine I, I bought insurance and I, uh, I'm not saying I hope I'll never use it, but uh, it's probably better that I don't use it. Okay, but we all have insurance. As a matter of fact, insurance is mandated by the government, particularly auto insurance and so forth. Okay, so that's the story. So they had this thing and he gave me the tape, which I stored, promptly stored. That was 1994. And then in the year 1999, 1999, no. It was the year 2008, no, 2009 that we got on the web with YouTube because YouTube did not appear until the year 2006. And then we waited three years as usual to get on top of it. And then I decided that the visual lab was gonna go, we already were static, we were dynamic, now we wanna go raster, meaning videos, right? So we started going and I pulled out all the tapes I had, the VCR tapes, and I was gonna convert them digital. I bought a converter, a digital converter. And I was going to convert uh, analog to digital and post on the web as the first videos that we were posting. Learn how to post a video on the web. It took us a couple of months, I remember, September 2009. A couple of months, 
we had to fiddle with it, ask everybody. Many people said, we don't know, I'm sorry. We finally had to do it and we did it. And one of the first videos that I posted on the web on my site was that video that Phil Berge gave me on the failure of the Colorado spillways. A video, by the way, which has a lot of traffic on the web. People assume that it's Professor Pons that did it. Nothing farther from the truth. I didn't do it, I just posted it. If you note, the authors, I didn't steal anything, I just posted the thing and made it easy for people to access it. It has a lot of traffic, people like it. People like to see disasters. That's the human nature when there is a disaster. Okay, going back to the Santa Cruz here, I kind of got overextended there on the other. The Santa Cruz problem in the year 1983 was the same caused by the same issue, regional, uh, mesoscale. Re, uh, mesoscale means at the, at the scale of the world. Mesoscale, global scale is the whole world. Mesoscale is kind of in between. Uh, the mesoscale issues of meteorology that cause the rain in this place to go high and produce that flood. So I'm going to next, when I come back, I'll, I'll continue to, to discuss this issue, very interesting issue. And then I'm gonna show you how we solve the problem. Thank you.